everyone, Brian Beeler coming to you with the podcast. We're live in Houston, Texas at uh, HPE's corporate office here. I've got uh, Patrick with me. What's what's going on today? What are we so excited about? So today is the HPE GreenLeg Day for storage. Um, and so we have uh, a number of uh, industry illuminaries like yourself. And, really? Uh, yeah, yeah uh-huh. exactly. Uh, here in town. <laughs> You're trying to butter me up at the end of the day? You Analysts, the press, morning. customers, partners. We have the Dallas Cowboys here. Yeah. Right? And we're talking about a number of different uh, solutions and services that we're bringing to market through uh, GreenLake. So you've got all sorts of new stuff. You've got new file, you've got new block, you've got uh, protection, some Zerto DR stuff, uh, and hardware platform. Yep. So that's five things. What do we start with? Uh, I mean, I always start with the GreenLake cloud platform, right? Because that's the sort of the centerpiece of our strategy. Um, So when you think about HPE GreenLake, uh, for us, it is a way to consume and manage a number of different services for infrastructure. And for us, you know, that's around storage, right? So data management and storage. And so the first thing that we have is around GreenLake for block storage. So our customers come to us and say, hey, listen, I have this need. I have, I need business critical, mission critical block storage. What do you have for me, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we can do is provide them a set of platforms that are managed in the GreenLake uh, console, right? So it's a cloud management experience. They can consume it in a couple different ways, right? They can either buy CapEx or they have subscription services. They can pay as they grow, you know, for example, what we do with our GreenLake OpEx model. But essentially we're bringing a new product to market under GreenLake uh, for block storage. So that consists of two pieces. One is a brand new operating system uh, that's gonna bring customers a whole set of features, right? Um, A lot of high-end features, right? You'd get on the availability side, the performance side, uh, a number of things around uh, replication and you know complex sort of DR uh, things that we do that are required by enterprise and mid-range customers. Um, so brand new operating system that we have, uh, and that's gonna the the intention for that over time is gonna scale up and scale out. Has a lot of simplicity. It has a lot of great things that customers like built into it as well, right? So unbelievable service model, um, all the capabilities that we have with InfoSight, right? Mm-hmm. So a really really cool model on the software side. In addition to the cloud, you know, management experience, and that's built on what we call Electra MP, right? So it's a brand new hardware platform. Uh, I think you may have taken a look at that and gotten some I disassembled some, it. Yes. Yeah, disassembled it. I, I'm sure you did. Uh, and so that's a scalable, you know, hardware building block architecture that, in this first version that we're launching uh, now. It's, uh, it's really aimed at some of the mid-range customers and price points. So it's a two-node system. You can actually expand, expand it with uh, JBOF shelves. Uh, and then later on in the future, we're going to have uh, more of a switched architecture that will provide those IO modules and those, those shelves, those JBOF shelves, to be able to scale out N ways, right? So east and west, north and south, and you know, likewise. So again, we got the GreenLake cloud platform, right? Through our data services cloud console, allows you to you know purchase, uh, consume, and manage all of your storage, right? In this case, block storage. Brand new operating system that has a ton of features and that fills a gap for you know a number of customers in the mid range and the enterprise space, and it's delivered on this new scalable architecture called Electra MP. Okay, so let's tear into some of that because I want to explore this a little bit more. So I saw the demos. We went through how to provision and manage block, and we uh, went through how to manage multiple types of storage underneath, whether Mm -hmm. it's uh, Nimble, the new MP, or uh, Primera, or whatever it is, of of multiple generations, too, I think, in that demo as well. Um, What's the decision-making tree look like for your customers when they're trying to think about how they want to consume their infrastructure going forward. Because I think still most of the world is, I buy switches, I buy servers, I buy yep. storage, and I manage them independently. And if I'm really fancy, I use you know something like an InfoSight to, to get visibility mm-hmm. into it, maybe some manageability, but yep. I'm still managing them in the traditional way. What What's the switch for just for block specific in case it's different for other parts. Yeah, so I say like uh, what what we're doing with customers now is a lot more uh, oriented around attributes and workloads, right? Okay. So we're doing selling and architecting of solutions based on a set of application attributes. Like so for example, if a customer comes to us and says, I have a very heavily virtualized environment, mm-hmm. right? I have 
this number of VMs, there's these type of VMs, I need this type of availability, I have this type of latency, this is sort of my compute hardware ba uh, storage balance. Um, we can take those attributes and feed them into our sizing models, right? So we have a set of sizing tools, we have the ability to assess that for customers. If they can't figure out how to do that on their own, we have um, uh, great tools like, for example, Cloud Physics. You saw mm -hmm. that tile up there, mm -hmm. which will, you know, essentially agentless go and take a look at all their APIs around their existing compute networking and storage, and very easily sort of come to a, a you know, a, a good architecture for what they need now and into the future. So we're definitely talking a lot more on um, attribute, you know, based buying and outcomes, which is essentially like I have the service, I have this SLA, I need, you know, HP, you go figure it out and help me out and do that, and we provide the, the tools to go do that. Well, for that part, let yep. me ask you about that, because yeah. uh, uh, I was talking with Omer before, and, mm. and I was asking him a lot of questions about, uh, about infrastructure and hardware, and eventually he's just like, we're telling customers just to don't worry about it. Like, we're gonna deliver you, to your point, your mm -hmm. SLA, what your application needs, uh, a management interface that's, yes. that's dead simple to use, so for your practitioners, it's, it's crazy easy. Um, a lot of policy-driven decisions that just uh, adopt those attributes based on the workload loads and just push, kind of push it out as you go. Absolutely. Uh, is, is that, what do customers make of that message? Because the industry has taught them for the last several decades that specs and speeds and feeds are the most important 100%. Things. Yeah, so um, it's definitely a new style of customer and also I'd say that I'm seeing less RFPs that are completely spec based, honestly. So f fewer, I need whatever. Yeah, fewer are like, please tell me the max number of IOPS that you have. Please tell me the max number of LUN count that you have. Please tell me the max, you know, saturated bandwidth you have on front end fiber channel ports, you know. Because okay. I think a lot of people understand that that's a lot of, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't move the needle at the end of the day. What the customers love to come to us about and say, hey, listen, you guys do this really well, right? You've got, a population of 50 to 100,000 customers out there running the workloads. Are the workloads really that different between customers? You know, running VMware? Not so sure, right? So we have a whole, you know, uh, telemetry database based on InfoSight mm -hmm. where I can say, hey, listen, to, you know, an 80, 85% confidence, confidence interval when I take a look at the install base, like this is what most people are doing, right? This is the data compaction ratio they get. This is the bandwidth and performance. This is the VM packing density they can get, you know? So it's like, hey, listen, if I can take that global knowledge that we get from our, you know, our telemetry and our information and then put that into a set of rules and recommendations based on a couple, you know, customer, some key attributes, then you take the mystery out of it. And then also customers, I'm just not seeing as many uh, customers buying on horizontal lines anymore. Right. Like, give, hey, I have two preferred server vendors. I have two, you know, networking switch providers. I have, you know, two or three enterprise storage vendors. Um, that's more of like a procurement discussion. Most customers now are like, I don't even have a storage admin team anymore for, you know, mid-sized customers. They have a VM admin team, right? Maybe they have an application operations team, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't want to be in the business of being storage experts. Well, I mean, we've been saying it for several years now that these teams aren't getting bigger. They're getting, no. they're getting smaller. They're being forced to do more with less and that sort of thing. Correct. And they're also confronted with workloads like containers and stuff that many of them didn't understand, at least not initially. Yep. And, and often they're handed them, right? So we're okay. seeing a lot of customers in the enterprise space that are running mode two workloads now on-prem in production. And the operations team and the enterprise infrastructure teams really don't know what to do with them, right? <laughs> so any help that we can give them is, you know, greatly appreciated. Help managing and protecting them because yes. I will never forget the first Kubicon I went to. It was really neat. A lot of stuff going on, a lot of cool stuff going on. It took me a while to wrap my head around, like, what, what is going on? I mean, yep. there, there was so much of that. And I started probing with some of these guys, like, what what's uh what's your data protection scheme look like? And they looked at me as if I was speaking some foreign language. And I know it's matured since then, but still some of these these DevOps cloud first style of of modalities aren't always as enterprise formal yep. in terms of data protection, IP protection, 
being aware of whatever governmental requirements you may have or, or, or data sovereignty or any of these types of things that all get really important at scale. Yeah, we're starting to see a very repeatable uh, pattern emerge where uh, some of the, the enterprise customers that are using obviously Kubernetes and things like OpenShift and EKS and our Esmeralda data fabric to do things like offering a new set of services in mm -hmm. conjunction, in parallel, or adjacent to some of the mode one services that they've always provided. So new new mobile apps, new you know um, web experiences. You know they're making acquisitions and doing integrations. That that infrastructure is running on prem on like, traditional IT. Yeah. Right. So servers, networking, storage. You know, 100% available storage. Uh, maybe they're using some different data constructs like scale out file, or I'm seeing a lot of um, object in the space as well. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so the other one of the other new things is file mm. in for GreenLake, and this one's kind of interesting because you've got the same Electra MP hardware fundamentally underneath, a little different persona on the NIC. So you yep. have 100 gig instead of fiber, sure. if, you know what, that you might have for block. Uh, and you've partnered with Vast Data to be the uh, the software engine behind that. Can you talk about just that offering and that relationship a little bit? Yeah. So file, obviously, that's an area of growth in the market uh, around unstructured data. Right. And you know, from us, from my perspective, I, you know, I don't see a lot of value in, in bespoke hardware in this space. You know, right now. Um, so the things that we can do to make it, um, especially after su the supply chain, you know, disruption, mm -hmm. we want to have well-known vendors with very available components, right? That we can uh, ship in volume galactically, right? Because we, we we push a lot of units. S space. <laughs> yes, we we actually if, know, you, if you go out, yeah, yeah if you go in our we're here in our enterprise briefing center and. We have systems that we've sent to space. That's the new edge, right? right. Um, and so, for us to, you know, have that type of, um, for more, it's around risk and being able to have, you know, a very, you know, predictable supply chain experience for our customers. Um, on file specifically, um, that's a huge area of growth in the in the data center, right? Unstructured data, and for us to be able to um, have a set of partners now that are curated um, and have a really good experience with the GreenLake Cloud Platform, I think is really important. It opens up the capability to do that in other areas, not just you know file. It helps out right. with other adjacent services that we might want to offer our customers that are adjacent to storage and enterprise data management, you know, right? Things like hmm. security, um, things like you know, we're, we're not known for, you know, open source or we don't have our own database, you know, for example, but a lot of customers have those services that are really, really tied into their application pipeline. So you have enterprise storage, you have unstructured data. Maybe you have a you know a scale out uh, database, for example, someone like something like MongoDB or whatnot. So it gives us the ability to have a set of curated um, partnerships that are uh, you know architected, consumed, managed on the GreenLake platform, day zero, day one, and day two operations running on our you know, hardware and you know, essentially managed alongside a number of other services. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cool, um, it's, it's, it's gonna be, we're gonna be doing more of it you know, when we go forward. More partnering generally, yeah, you think? absolutely. Or, well, or, or, or a different part of partnering. I would say that HPE, as you've seen, right, is, has a very open uh, ecosystem, mm -hmm. very partner friendly, and we wanna have the most modern partner ecosystem for our customers, right? So whether it's databases or virtualization or security or whatnot, you know, we wanna plug into those folks, like whether it's ServiceNow or right. you know, for automation or you know, other things that are out there. Um, we wanna have a modern uh, way to partner with folks and you know, doing it through either a marketplace or you know, through the cloud platform is gonna be the way that we're gonna be you know, evolving that over time. So the file uh, consumption is the same as you outlined for Block, right? In terms of what, how customers can pick it up, yep. and they start. Um, it sounds big, but in file, it's really not. It, it's 250 terabytes or something. Yeah, that's usually start. a pretty small entry point for right. that class of you know file storage. Right. Yeah. And I know you haven't done the studies yet, but we know from our relationship with Vast. I mean, the scalability is is off the charts with that thing. So you should, as you get customers coming to you with with multi uh, petabyte type requests. I mean, that, that should be a layup with something like this. Yeah, absolutely. Like, as I said before, uh, unstructured data, especially file uh, in the in the data center is a huge opportunity. Yep. Yeah. And then lastly, you know, we uh, the 
it's, you know, those are the protocols. We have the systems. We're providing, you know, essentially infrastructure as a service. Um, you know, being able to add the data services on top of it is super important. So, uh, and then ultimately having that integrated and it's really easy, right? Um, Selling backup, selling data protection, selling risk mitigation is really hard, right? It's like selling insurance. You know, you're like, hey, if you don't do this, something bad's gonna happen. Right. So you wanna make that, um, and it's not an ROI conversation, it's more of a TCO conversation, right? So you wanna make it simple, you wanna make it you know, as economical as possible to reach that SLA. So by providing um, VM backup as a service, for example, that's mm -hmm. like completely integrated with our primary storage mm -hmm. products, you know, integrates into the product and integrates more importantly into the workflow. And then you can tie those things together. And then for, you know, obviously when you have a, a product like Zerto and disaster recovery as a service, it gives you a higher service level around being able to recover. So, you know, backup is usually in days, maybe hours. And Zerto is like minutes and seconds, right? So it's yeah, like- Yeah, we went yeah. through that demo yeah. too. And, and actually what struck me with that one, and, and I don't have a lot of hands-on experience with Zerto, but the um, the way you've bubbled up the key aspects again. I mean, this is consistent throughout the whole the whole cloud plane that you have. Uh, but for an administrator to see my sites, to see my uh, my RPO, to be able to initiate a test mm -hmm. fail, and to be able to pull up your vCenter and just watch tests spin up, tests yep. spin down, VM boots, turn it off, and and move on. Um, is is pretty nifty, and and I also and think you don't need to be a DR expert. No, I could do it. <laughs> exactly. Right. So that's the whole point, you know. So that you're you're getting it in the lens of a VM admin or right. application admin, which is great. You know? Yeah, and and to get the compliance reports and the other yep. stuff that you can submit and make sure that your your organization is is protected. Because how many times have you seen DR get set up in a traditional infrastructure and never tested, and th and then when it hits the fan. Then, Everyone's scrambling. Then we find yeah. out that that no one had tested this for a month and it doesn't work. Or, we see it a lot. Or VMs weren't protected. We thought were protected, or or whatever, right? Yeah, we're seeing that more and more with uh, ransomware, right? I mean, sure. it's uh, that is a uh, I wouldn't say it's a classic DR event, right? As like you know more of in the past, you're architecting against a natural disaster, a uh, cable cut, you know, or something like that. But this is you know certainly. The results are similar at the end of the day. Like you have a set of infrastructure that's completely unavailable. And with you know ransomware, it's happening more and more. It's really painful. Yeah. We get calls from customers all the time and it's just it's 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 heartbreaking as a business partner. You know? Well they go it seems to me that they're going after uh, small medical practices, places like that where the data you you can't let it go. Mm -hmm and you don't have the IT infrastructure to go fight it, and they're paying because they don't they don't have a choice. Yep. A bunch of little hospitals and other, you know, some other older school industries, uh, you know, moving stuff around that that just that that haven't invested in in their infrastructure quite Correct. so much. Yep. So one other thing that strikes me with all the demos I saw today was that three the three or four people giving the demos, everyone said the same sort of thing of, here's what we're doing, here's the operational simplicity it delivers. By the way, we recognize that we've got, we want to do this and this and this, and that's just the stuff that we're willing to talk about. We've got a roadmap that, that's pretty highly detailed for, for some distance out. So how do you balance how much you want to deliver at launch, how much you, know, you continue to roll out and, and, and manage that? Because it seems to me you could over-architect this thing mm -hmm. and sit on it longer and release it with a, a ton of stuff. You could do, you know, less and, and wait for your customers to tell you what you want or somewhere in between, but that spectrum is kind of important to figure out. Yeah, it's interesting um, that you bring this up because it's a, it's a thing that we, I wouldn't say we struggle with, but we have to plan around, which is in general in storage systems that you've seen over your career, right? Um, those are usually delivered in some kind of a waterfall, mm -hmm. you know, release methodology where, you know, you've got an initial system that comes out maybe every 12 months you'll get a major operating system update mm -hmm. and then every you know tick tock to that six months later you'll get like an upgrade you know speed bump on cpus or sure. memory or whatnot right but really what that says is that you know i'm you know i have to wait 18 months you know after initial release for major functionality upgrades right to my storage subsystem what this allows us to do by decoupling the management plane 
is we have a core set of features that are obviously on you know the storage subsystems, things that do like everything to do with the data plane, right? The data storage, data deduplication, data movement. Um, and so those are table stakes and you know we have a great system. But there's a lot of things that make the storage subsystem and the offering uh, much more simpler and easy to use and value added on top of that. And with the GreenLake Cloud Platform, we can essentially like release that on a, you know, every couple weeks, monthly basis. Whatever right? cadence makes yeah, sense. Yeah, exactly. So we can put that feature. So the model, which, you know, we, we talk to customers about is that, you know, we're unlocking innov innovation. So we get a lot of questions like, why do I want to cloud connect this? That sounds complicated. I've never done before. That's, mm -hmm. That sounds icky to me. Um, but then when you give them a demonstration that essentially, I'm going to give you cooler stuff faster right? More updates, better experience, fix your bugs. If you, like we've de demonstrated that when customers have like a, for example, re request for enhancement on some kind of a usability or monitoring yeah. type of feature, we're able to catalog that, put it in the backlog, prioritize it, push it up into the system in usually like something like six to eight weeks. So, you know, you can, a customer can re request a feature and then boom, it gets prioritized, upvoted, bam, it shows up in the product. So it's a really great experience, you know, for customers. So you have that like kind of decoupled platform plus the, all the advantages of what you get from a SaaS delivery model. Yeah, uh, our customer, I guess they're getting more ready for that, right? Yes. Because you know, from the traditional storage business, you'd put out a system and then you go, you do your annual release, but a lot of customers would sit and wait for that next one to the come next out, release, and yep. then they would pick it. So that, I mean, you're talking about 18 months trailing, but they might be trailing another six, a year on top of that in terms of reluctance to change anything yep. because there's always a, it's data, right? This is, this is our stuff, and if something happens that's unexpected, um, bad things <laughs> they occur. Yeah, absolutely. Right. But on the other hand, I'd say uh, most of the situations that we get into from a customer quality perspective um, are driven by people that are not adopting and not moving to the newest firmware releases, newest operating system, newest UI. Right. And so when we have you know a great tool like InfoSight, for example, we can immediately go and tell customers like, you know, 75% of the install base has run into this bug. If you do not update, you know, immediately you're going to run into this and you're going to get an outage, mm. like guaranteed. And so people are like, oh, wow, okay, I should probably do that right now. And then, you know, we can prefetch the update, you know, obviously help them out. So this, I think people are starting to see this, um, you know, because people are used to apps updating every day, operating systems on your iPhone, up, you know, updating every day, yeah. your Chrome browser updating, you know. Sometimes versus, multiple times yeah, a day. <laughs> exactly, so I think this sort of like, you know, continuous delivery of improvement, especially when, with regard to quality, security, you know, some of the usability functions is uh, starting to be expected in the infrastructure world. Yeah, well, I mean, that makes sense. And I, I guess it's just one of those transitions as the traditional infrastructure teams you know, get younger, more dynamic, whatever, maybe they're a little more willing to, yep. to adopt on a rolling basis, which this platform gives you a great opportunity to be more iterative and, um, and, and have, you know, like you said, new features, fixes, whatever, rolled out on a, on a perpetual basis. Yep. Would, does HPE culture have to change to account for that? Because it's not just the customer. That has to change. Oh, right? absolutely. There's a lot of cultural norms that need to change. I mean, just in general, moving from talking about boxes and speeds and feeds to workloads and outcomes, moving towards like a disaggregated model where you have a cloud control plane and you know infrastructure on prem, uh, you know, new support models that mm. arise from this in terms of more proactive support as a you know that rather than L1, L2, L3, L4, right. reactive type of support. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of learning going on, right? Um, you know, we're running a very large cloud platform right now across the globe, right? So we have our own site ROPs and, you know, security teams. And so, yeah, it's a, absolutely. But, you know, honestly, if, you know, we, you have to change, right? Uh, and evolve as a company or, you know, I don't, I think people that are just pushing boxes are going to kind of die a slow, horrible death over time, right? <laughs> Speaking of boxes, the, the MP hardware that's going into uh, block and file on GreenLake, I know you're not talking about it a lot at this event, but is it reasonable to expect then the traditional two node SAN kind of goes to something like this and get off the dedicated 
nimble, Primera, whatever else hardware? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we I see that you know having a uh, a similar hardware building block design that's going to fit. It fits a very a myriad of workloads, right? Sure. Um, it just it's easier, right? In terms of I have to do less test permutations per well, offering. You're building yep. one thing yes. with a couple different flavors depending yes. on, but it's the core item is just one one box, right? Yeah, exactly. And exactly. selling several thousand of those is better economics for the customer too than, than the smaller volume of the of the, uh, the, the SAM platform. Yeah, and I can pass those savings on to the customer in, in terms of a better quality product with more features. Uh, the other things I can do too is that essentially, you know, you can give the ability to, with you know, less um, hard, hardware permutations, I can do things like, hey, maybe I'll just ship you more capacity. Maybe that you don't need it now, right? But we can use software to unlock that, and you mm -hmm. can have instant access to it. You don't have to pay for it now, right? Well, that's one of the yeah. other things we didn't talk about it yeah. here yet, but that I think is interesting. And when you talk about the paradigm shift of of going to this cloud consumption model for infrastructure, you don't have to buy three years today. You, your capacity yep. for three years today, right? And so that's an interesting shift too. I think in the way people think about yes. the way they're making these investments, right? Yeah, and I think there's a model of uh, flexibility as well too, right? Some industries will com stay completely, you know, capex driven, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to outlay capital up front. That's the way their their internal, uh, you know, uh, accounting works for. You know, essentially, you see a lot of that in telco and you know various industries. Um, then you see customers who don't want to outlay any capital at all, right? And so they're more of like, I'd rather pay a premium now, you know, on a per, you know, uh, metered basis and have the flexibility, right, without having to, you know, basically, you know, pay all the cash up front from a CapEx right. perspective. I think that personally that the, the market's going to be dominated sort of by this hybrid model, right, which is like, I'm going to buy some now, but have reserve capacity that I can burst or pay for um, at, on demand. Right, which I think is a pretty powerful. Well, it covers well. it covers the fear of underbuying day one, right? If you know you've got a little bit of wiggle room yep. and, uh, and and can can burst out and because things change. I mean, this is kind of reminds me of the shift to HCI way back when, right? Because as soon as people started, oh, I'm going to just going to throw my VDI on there or mm -hmm. whatever, and then like, oh, that that worked. I'm going to throw my databases on there. That worked, and they just keep throwing more and more, yep. more workloads at it. I mean, something, I expect you'll see similar behaviors here as customers like, well, we'll throw, we'll try file out, we'll throw something on there, have some sort of success, and then, you know, land and expand, right? Yep, absolutely. Well, this is cool. I'm glad to see you guys uh, doing this in, in person, having this day down here in Houston, and um, it's been a great deal of fun. And, and by the way, credit to your team, all the guys doing the demos, the, the hardware nerds that I you know, bludgeoned with uh, yep. uh, questions. Uh, everyone down here has been really great. Yeah, what's this connector? <laughs> what's this thing do? Yeah, I, they're they're yes. very knowledgeable. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm one of the few that really gets uh, that passionate about the hardware still. Uh, but look, I mean that fundamentally, it's the engineering underneath the covers that drives yes. your ability to do all these other things. And so. there's a lot of engineering in that platform, even though we do call it you know sort of a commodity based. Um, building block platform. The design is really robust, and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna allow us to scale, you know, throughout a number of years in in, in architectures. But yeah, it was great having everyone here to hear the story. I mean, we feel like we've got, um, you know, we set on this journey about three years ago to start providing all of our data services and all of our systems, mm -hmm. essentially cloud connected. Um, data services that are not tied to the box anymore, um, and then we can give customers a really flexible uh, consumption experience depending on you know where they are in their life cycle. So it's yeah, it's it's a lot of um, validation in terms of the strategy and bringing that to life for customers. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, we look forward to playing with it. Awesome. More. Yeah, we'll get you one. <laughs> All right, thanks, Brad. Thank you very much. <laughs>